St. Crow Island is in the Virgin Islands, which is in the Caribbean. This island, back in the day, was ruled by the Dutch. There was a guy there who was a sugar plantation manager, a Jewish Dutch guy. He met a mixed lady who was mostly Spanish with a little Creole and Caribbean blood in her. She and this sugar guy had a few kids together, and one of them was named William. And William Leidesdorf is the topic of this episode of Ricky's Historical Tidbits. This is Ricky's Historical Tidbits Podcast, and this is Ricky Mortensen. William grew up on St. Crow and was very well educated. He was proficient in business, law, and language. Soon enough, when he was old enough, he was sent to the land of opportunity to start a career in shipping over in Louisiana. This is uh, the 1830s, by the way, before the Civil War. Leidesdorf, being mostly white, had never any problem with anybody regarding his race, except with his girlfriend in New Orleans. She and him were engaged, and he decided to tell her that he was part colored, which freaked her out, and the wedding was called off. She died not long after that, some say from shock. Well, anyway... He captained a ship out of New Orleans for a little bit longer, sailing all over the place from New York all the way to the Sandwich Island, which is Hawaii. One day, he was laid off when he was at Port in Yerba Buena, Alta California, which we call San Francisco today. He had to make a choice at that point. You know, Yerba Buena uh, at this time was not all that grand. It was just a basic old fishing town with a couple hundred people living there. The choices were, one, finding a new ship to captain, Or two, take a risk and try his hand at business. So he did number two. He was smart, and he had a side hustle while he was a ship captain selling hides and beef tallow, which got him enough money to buy a plot of land, and the next year he built a warehouse. Being in Alta, California, he was in Mexico, not the United States. And Mexico gave away land to anybody who became citizens of Mexico. But you have to have had lived there for at least a year or more. When the time came, William went over to claim his land. He was given a nice piece of land right by the American river called Rancho Rio de los Americanos. Now that's way inland from Yerba Buena where he had built his business, but he gladly took it with visions of ranching there. So William set out to New Helvetia, which is the name Johann Sutter had named what we now know as Sacramento. There he met Johann, and seeing as their properties connected, they sat out on horseback to check it out, and basically kind of made sure they're on the both they're both on the same page on where each other's invisible fences were. In this time period, in this general area, actual money was worthless. It was all pretty much bartering. Eh, some, some trades were money, like pesos or francs or dollars, but many a time it would be in hides, chickens, silver, land, food, slaves. One time, Johann Sutter paid William Leidesdorf in slaves, and Leidesdorf, of course, accepted. Slavery, for him, was common and no big deal. Sutter was kind of known for his slaves, though. Here's a picture of Johann Sutter. He was well known in California for his fort and also for gold being discovered on his property by Mr. James Marshall. Now, William built the first hotel in Yerba Buena, and he named it the City Hotel. This hotel was one of the things that brought William to high standing as it was extremely profitable, and he hosted all kinds of parties and shows at the hotel. In fact, it was William Leidesdorf that hosted the first minstrel show on the West Coast. If you don't know what a minstrel show is, it's basically a comedy show of people in blackface. So yeah, that happened. But he also brought one of the most fun sports to watch of all time to California as well. Yes, my big hat loving friends, horse racing was introduced to California by Mr. William Lattister. 
and the getaway to a good start with a favorite, Olympia, going right to the front, closely followed by Jackstown, John's Joy, and Kentucky. Now, around this time, more and more Americans were coming over. This was before the gold was even discovered. So not a ton of people, but San Francisco, for example, had a whole thousand people now. William and some of his friends knew the importance of education, so he helped start the first school and sat on the school board as well. Along with that, William was on a few different committees for the city and even was the city treasurer. But all that had to be put on halt for one year, because Consul Larkin of the United States of America to Mexican California appointed him to be vice consul as tensions between Mexico and Californians were brewing. A consul is basically an ambassador, but a little different. Americans were coming to California but had no interest in becoming Mexican citizens. There was no dual citizenship back then. So you had to renounce your American citizenship and become a Mexican, which William did so that he can get that land grant, but he always stayed loyal to America, which was why he was appointed vice consul. Well, potential war with Mexico was on everyone's minds, and in fact, there was a war in 1846, not really fought in California, but people, people in California were afraid the Mexicans would try and take back the control of California, and so go over in the Sonoma area, some Californians declared California as its own country, the Republic of California. William wrote to his boss, Consul Larkin, these words. It is impossible to say how many men they have, but I think the proclamation will call many to their banner, which is a white field, a red border, a large star, and a grizzly bear. Such is the flag of young California. William was not for this bear flag revolt as it's known today. He wanted California to be part of the United States. He worked hard getting everything situated so that in Sonoma, when the United States military showed up, they would take down the bear flag, raise the United States flag, shutting down the bear flag revolt and claiming California for the United States. William's main goal in this was to translate the proclamation of Commodore Sloat into Spanish so that everybody knew what was going on. And then over at Sutter's Fort, a U.S. flag was raised as well. What was that proclamation, you ask? Well, I'm going to read it to you. It's long. Stay with me. It's very interesting. To the inhabitants of California, the central government of Mexico, having commenced hostilities against the United States by invading its territory and attacking the troops of the United States stationed on the north side of the Rio Grande and with a force of 7,000 men under the command of General Arista, who, which army was totally destroyed and all their artillery, baggage, and captured on the 8th and 9th of May last. By a force of 2,300 men under the command of General Taylor and the city of Matamoros taken and occupied by the forces of the United States, and the two nations, being actually at war by this transaction, shall hoist the standard of the United States at Monterey immediately, and shall carry it throughout the shall carry it out throughout California. I declare to the inhabitants of California that although I come in arms with a powerful force. I do not come among them as an enemy to California. On the contrary, I come as their best friend, as henceforward California will be a portion of the United States, and its peaceable inhabitants will enjoy the same privileges and rights they now enjoy, together with the privilege of choosing their own magistrates and other officers of the administration of justice among themselves and the same protection will be extended to them as any other state in the Union. They will also enjoy a permanent government under which life, property, and the constitutional right and lawful security to worship the Creator in the way most congenial to each one's sense of duty will be secured, which unfortunately the central government of Mexico cannot afford them destroyed as her resources are by internal fractions and corrupt officers who create constant revolutions to promote their own interests and to oppress the people. 
under the flag of the United States, California will be free from all such troubles and expense. Consequently, the country will rapidly advance and improve both in agriculture and commerce. As, of course, the revenue laws of the same in California as in all other parts of the United States, affording them all manufacturers and produce of the United States, free of any duty and all foreign goods, at one quarter pay, oops, and all foreign goods at one quarter of the duty they now pay. A great increase in the value of real estate and the products of California may also be anticipated. With the great interest and kind feelings I know the government and the people of the United States possess towards the citizens of California, the country cannot but improve more rapidly than any other on the continent of America. Such of the inhabitants of California, whether natives or foreigners, as may not be disposed to accept the high privileges of citizenship and to live peaceably under the government of the United States will be allowed to dispose of their property and to remove out of the country if they choose, without any restriction, or remain in it, observing strict neutrality. With full confidence in the honor and integrity of the inhabitants of the country, I invite the judges accolades, and other civil officers to retain their offices and to execute their functions as heretofore that the public tranquility may not be disturbed, at least until the government of the territory can be more definitely arranged. All persons holding titles to real estate or in quiet possession of lands under a color of right shall have those titles and rights guaranteed to them. All churches and the property they contain in possession of the clergy in California shall continue in the same rights and possessions they now enjoy. All provisions and supplies of every kind furnished by the inhabitants for the use of United States ships and soldiers will be paid for at fair rates. And no private property will be taken for public use without just compensation at the moment. See why I wanted to read it to you? Pretty interesting. Later on that day, Mr. Leidesdorf flew the stars and stripes on top of the city hotel back in San Francisco and hosted Commodore Sloat and his men to celebrate. William was relieved of his duty as vice consul after this was no longer needed and he could go back to building his businesses. Now, Leidesdorf was mostly a San Francisco guy. Most of his business was done there. But his cash cow, pun intended, was that ranch in the Sacramento area. His workers and maybe slaves out there would kill the cow, process it into hides and tallow, and of course meat, but it was that tallow and the hides that were the best. Plus, hides were kind of a form of currency, so he had a printing press of sorts, if you want to look at it that way. Anyways, just like today, people in San Francisco rely on those in the valley for their food and stuff like that. Well, the valley relies largely on factories and technology from the city. So trade between these two places was always going on, and William knew that it needed to be, and could be, improved. If you don't know, here's a map. San Francisco and Sacramento are connected by water. And though it's got a bunch of twists and turns in it, it's possible to make the trip. William wanted it to be a fast trip, not a long one. It takes about three days by wagon or horse to get from one place to the other. Being a ship captain, he knew it could be done, so he sent in an order to Russian Alaska for a small steamship. It was originally built to transport Russian dignitaries, but it was for sale, and so now it was sent down to Mr. Leidesdorf. This was the first steamer in the Bay Area ever, and it was a sidewheeler powered by a train engine. It was small, somewhere between 34 and 37 feet long, and it could carry about nine people total. But they had to be very careful not to move too much because the ship was top heavy and could tip over at any moment. Now, he, these are some pictures of what the steamer probably would have looked like. Supposedly, this one right here uh, is the one, but I couldn't get any particular confirmation on that. 
After sailing it around in San Francisco a little while, William set out on his super fast voyage to Sacramento. But it was ridiculously slow. Maybe the engine was not that strong. Maybe bad luck. Whatever it was, the trip took six days. Everyone on board, especially William, was irritated about how slow the trip was. One guy said he got off the boat seven miles from Sacramento and simply walked and got there seven hours before the ship did. Who knows if that's true, but that's pretty dang funny. Eventually, the ship went back to San Francisco, but to its luck, a big ship was making waves and the waves were a little too much for the little steamer and it sank. William Leidesdorf was described as intelligent, fairly well-educated, a polygot, meaning he spoke a lot of languages, enterprising, public-spirited, and honorable, but also quick-tempered, jealous, and quarreling. Eventually, though, one day William was sick. He was 38 years old and in good health, but he'd gotten a cold, or so he thought. William thought he would be fine, but ended up dying of typhoid fever, when his death was announced, all flags were flown at half-mast, and he was interned at Mission Dolores. William Ladisdorff never married, had no kids, had no real relationship with the rest of his family after he left the island, and he did not have any kind of will. So his old boss, Consul Larkin, took responsibility to deal with the huge estate, which at this point was the largest of all California at this point in time. But soon it was realized that William never re-became a United States citizen. And so nothing could be done legally on his end. So the state tried to take control of it, but was blocked by the courts. Eventually, some lawyer-type guy got it, and there was a petition within a year to get him removed, and so that happened. Then another guy got it, and you know, so on and so forth. Eventually, a guy named Captain Folsom came on the scene. Folsom saw this legal spaghetti and thought he'd try something risky. William was a United, um, Mexican citizen. The estate was on American land at this point. The only known potential heirs were all the way in the Caribbean. So Folsom traveled all the way to the island and met with William's mom, brothers, and sisters that still lived there. Folsom gave her the numbers he had uh, that he had figured, and they agreed that she inherited 50% and the brothers inherited 50% together. Then they came to an agreement to sell the land and estate to Mr. Folsom for $75,000. Folsom paid them in three installments, but before all the money could be accepted, others traveled to the island and told Mama Leidestorff that she had been duped. She was mad, as you can expect, and tried to cancel the deal. So Folsom and Mama Leidestorff went to court and battled it out. The argument on Folsom's side was that there was a ton of debt, about 40000 of which, on the estate, as well as issues in San Francisco with a fire having destroyed the city hotel, which, by the way, was true. Mama Leidesdorf argued that Folsom had lied about the amount, even so, and she agreed to the deal based on that number, which was about half of what, it was, what, what, what was more accurate. The court case went on for a while, but eventually he won the case and immediately became one of, or possibly the, richest men in California at that moment. But it didn't end there. Folsom had to fight for every little piece of property in court. Some lasted years and years. Folsom himself died, same age as William, 38 years old. And the court case over Rancho Rio de los Americanos outlived him. Now let's recap. William Leidesdorf was at the least 75% white. Passed as a white guy everywhere he went. And while that doesn't really matter, it's funny to know that today he is known as the African founder of California. Even though he didn't even identify as that. And he wasn't even from Africa. At most, he was 12 and a half Creole, 12 and a half Caribbean. He was pro-America throughout his life in the midst of slavery and helped California become part of the United States. He envisioned San Francisco as having great potential for a city and envisioned a speedy delivery between San Francisco and Sacramento. All in all, he was a very smart businessman who unfortunately did not think of death enough. Without a will... 
he left his estate up for grabs, which is not a very smart thing to do. That's it for this episode. Thank you so much for watching. Have a wonderful day. You've been listening to Ricky's Historical Tidbits Podcast. When you go to school and study history, they give you dates, they give you some names, and that's about it. But there's a lot more to California history, and that's where this show comes in. We hope you've gotten some useful and practical information from the show, and we hope you were entertained. And we'll be back soon. But in the meantime, hook up with us on Twitter and Instagram at busy underscore Ricky. Find us on Facebook at Ricky's Historical Tidbits. Till next time, this is Ricky's Historical Tidbits Podcast, signing off.